What is a program? Well, a program is a sequence of instructions that we as programmers will write in a specific language. But that language isn't going to be one that your computer can carry out and understand directly. So we're going to look at what an interpreter is that can take the code that we write and make it such that the computer itself can evaluate it and understand what we mean by it and follow our instructions. So let's first talk a little bit about what programs are. I like to think about programs as very similar or analogous to the idea of a recipe. They're a sequence of steps. Some of these steps are repeated. Right? Sometimes you come back to parts of your recipe after some time has, uh, has elapsed and you, and you have to repeat them. Similarly with programs, we'll see that there are algorithms, which I should mention uh, are sequences of steps that are fixed in size. An algorithm uh, is a set of instructions that is fixed in size, or I should say in its number of its instructions, in, uh, or in length of instructions, uh, but can uh, process arbitrary amounts of data or arbitrary sized problems. And this is really great, right? So the idea that we can uh, write a program that can operate on a small number of things or a large number of things and use the exact same program to do both is one of the superpowers of being able to write programs. And so algorithms are going to be sequences of steps that we instruct the computer to carry out. We tend to think of programs in two, at two different levels. And this is, of course, a spectrum. But for, some, for uh, simplicity's purpose, let's just talk about uh, these as two distinct levels. First, let's talk about high-level programs. These are what we will be focused on in this course. And we will write these in a high-level programming language which we'll discuss on the next board. But high-level programs are for humans to read and write and are much easier to understand than low-level programs, which are how we would classify the other kind of program. So low-level programs are expressed much more closely in terms of the machine that our code is running on. So these are closer to the central processing unit's simple instruction set. If we were learning how to program with low-level programs, we would have a really tough time. It's, they're very simplistic. Ultimately, though, our high-level programs need to make their way to being understood with low-level program instructions. And so, luckily, people have invented interpreters, which we'll talk about later, in order to make this process automated so that we don't have to do this manually ourselves. We have a program that can make this translation happen for us uh, without much work. So programs are written in languages, and we're going to be focused on high-level programming languages. Programming languages are designed by and for humans. The first programming language was written by Dr. Grace Hopper, and it was the Flowmatic language. She invented it in 1955, so programming languages have been around and been evolving for the past 70 years. Uh, and I spelled humans wrong. Uh, and the what she recognized was that it was very tedious to write instructions precisely in terms of only what the computer was able to do itself. It would be really nice if we had a higher level language that we could express our thoughts in more naturally. And one of the ways that I want to make an analogy here that I think you can understand is the difference between a high level language and a low level language is the difference between me asking you to, uh, you know, touch your nose or something like that. That's an instruction that I gave you. If you, if you touched your nose, that's a high-level instruction. If we were thinking in terms of what a low-level instruction might look like, it's all of those really minuscule you know, firing of muscles, like bring your hand a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer, uh, activate your, your bicep a little bit. Those, those very low-level movements that we don't even consider as part of carrying out these high-level instructions uh, it's a very similar differentiation between high-level programming languages and low-level programming languages. The types of things that the computer can do are very simple. 
And, and it feels a lot like, you know, extend your finger a little bit more, uh, extend your finger a little bit more if you wanted to make a peace sign, right? So our high level languages are much more pleasant to work in. And there are many different programming languages. We're gonna be focused in this course on the Python programming language. But a language has a set of rules, uh, so the syntax rules. And these syntax rules are things like where you can place punctuation, how you carry, uh, how you format your the spaces and the tabs and the new lines, so spacing, uh, rules for names, how we express things like numbers. And there are these syntactical concerns and each language tends to have its own syntax rules. And these are like the grammar rules of a written language. Right? It's a very similar concept there. But there are also semantics and the semantics of a language are uh, how we interpret or how the, what is the meaning, what is the effect, intended effect and I should say expected as well, of some instruction that we, we make. Right? So syntax are the rules and semantics are, well, what happens when this, this line or this, this instruction is actually carried out? Some other things that we'll learn are about languages are that they uh, have some reserved words. There are some special words that we can't use. Uh, so reserved words these have special meaning and we'll use reserved words uh, for to carry out various um, different kinds of things in our programs. So when we declare functions, when we get to talking about um, uh, how we make the computer loop through something many times over, there are special reserved words we'll use that we can't use for any other purpose. They have one meaning and one meaning only within the context of, of the language. And uh, great, so languages also have this notion of defining things and declaring certain concepts. So we're gonna be expressing things in terms of um, an idea that we want to declare exists in, in terms of our program, such as if we're writing a calculator for our grade and we wanted to declare that a, a certain number represented the uh, points that we had for our quizzes. We could say that this a certain name of a variable is quizzes and it's going to have a specific meaning. So typically we'll have some uh, things like declarations, which you can also think of as definitions. And other instructions, uh, which are uh, statements. And the statements that we make are gonna be more actionable. So when we declare something, when we define it, we're kind of saying, here's what this is. And then we'll learn other kinds of statements that we can make as we get into the course um, that actually take action and, and are written in terms of those declarations. So maybe we uh, have a, a statement that computes our final grade based on some of the things that we had declared earlier in our program. All right. So how is it that the code that we write in our language, and in this course we'll be focused on the Python programming language, is actually evaluated on the central processing unit because what we write is gonna feel almost like English with different rules applied. Um, but the machine, it, you know, it thinks in terms of binary at the end of the day. So something's got to take our code and interpret it and act on it in a way that uh, the machine can actually understand. Well, there are two kinds of programming languages uh, broadly, uh, and you can think of programming languages as ones that are interpreted, which is gonna be our focus, where as each statement and declaration and um, sort of complete unit of code is evaluated, it's immediately acted upon. And this is a little bit different from a different kind of concept, a different kind of programming language called a compiled language that we're not gonna be focused on, so I'm not gonna say anything more about it. 
So what is an interpreter all about? Well, an interpreter is a program that reads in other programs. in a specific language. All right, so we'll be using a Python interpreter and it's going to read the statements, the declarations, the definitions that we make in Python, and it's gonna interpret those. Now, this process of reading and then inter interpreting or reading and then more technically evaluating is something that happens over and over again as our program is being interpreted by this uh, interpreter. So there are two steps that we're primarily concerned with. There's this read step, and that's checking our syntax. So remember, syntax are the rules about what we can name things, the spaces that we can use, um, just the general structure. It's kind of like the commas, the periods, the exclamation points, the semicolons of English. Uh, and, and the rules around what we, how we structure our paragraphs and our sentences. Um, the syntax of Python will have different rules, but those are the syntax. So when your interpreter reads your code, it's checking that syntax. If you have a syntax error, which is very common when you're getting started with programming, um, that means it's in this reading step. Before your program is, is acted upon, it's, we're gonna check and make sure that we can actually understand it uh, and, and that it follows those rules. If you've written your program with correct syntax, it's not necessarily a correct program. As you all know, you can have bugs in your programs. Your programs can behave in unpredictable and unexpected ways. They can crash, things like this. So there's also an evaluation step. And this is where the semantics come into play, right? So after your program has been read by the interpreter or a, a unit of your program has been read by the interpreter, it goes and evaluates that. And what that means is it, it, it takes the semantics of what you just expressed and it tries to carry those out for your on your behalf. So this is follows your instructions. This happens within the context of a process. So when you begin a process, you're actually beginning your interpreter and that interpreter is gonna read your code as its uh, input and check it for syntax and then carry out the instructions that are asked. And it's gonna do so within the memory that it has available, that the operating system made available to it. One of the things that's really neat about an interpreter that we'll learn in an upcoming lesson is that we can interpret entire programs at a time or we can work interactively. And I'll make a quick note of this, um, uh, modalities. So there are two different modes that are very common. And a third one that we'll learn later on that's that's really cool, that's kind of exists in between these two modes. Um, but there's one mode called interactive programming, programming. And this is the ability to type in a, a command, type in a declaration, a definition, type in some syntax, and have the interpreter immediately read it and evaluate it and act upon it. So your program is running and, and as you're um, interactively programming, you're modifying and manipulating the memory of your, your process. And uh, this is really great for tinkering and playing around. Um, but there's also a, the idea of a stored program. And when you're working with a stored program, we'll be working in VS Code and saving our files to a certain kind of Python file. Python files end in the, uh, the extension .py. And we'll write those programs as if we're writing down a recipe. And then we can ask the interpreter to, hey, go read and evaluate that entire program that we wrote all in one go. And that's much more common and useful when you're writing larger programs. So interactive programming is great for tinkering, whereas stored programs are great for uh, longer, bigger, more complex applications. And that's what we'll be focused on for the most part, but we'll see that we use interactive programming to just understand some of the fundamentals that we're, we're, we're playing around with. This is possible because as each chunk of code is uh, read into our interpreter, it's evaluated. The interpreter is a process, as I mentioned, and that means it has some memory. And 
as programmers, we're very concerned about and, and the way that we achieve the results and, and, and tackle the problems that we want to tackle is by making use of memory and storing our results, working through our results that are, that are in memory using instructions. When the Python interpreter begins, it has some memory available to our program. And it's worth knowing what exists in that memory before our code evaluates. So before we get to do anything at all, what is made available to us? Every programming language tends to have its own, what we think of as built-in functionality. Uh, and Python is no different. So as we move through this course, we'll be trying to visualize what's happening in our processes memory, in our program's memory when it's running, uh, using some diagramming techniques that we'll start looking at here, uh, just the very fundamentals of. Um, and actually, we're going to see some things here that we won't include in future diagrams because they're just expected and built in. But let's talk about what happens when a Python interpreter begins. Well, it has a special area of memory that we'll think of as the call stack. We don't yet know what this call stack is, um, but this is where uh, the names, uh, generally, we can think of this as where uh, the names of uh, uh, everything in our, defined in our program In our, and I should say more specifically our process. So the, the names of everything defined in our process are bound. And by bound, I mean we, they have a meaning associated with them. You can have names that don't have any meaning associated with them yet. That means they're unbound. But when a name is bound, that means it's, it's a term that we've defined and it has meaning in our program. We'll look at how do we introduce new names and concepts into our programs through things called variables and functions. Um, but for now, the, the primary purpose of the call stack is just to keep track of what are all of the things that we've defined. We're, we're building up a little world here. And before we get to define our own concepts in our program, the Python language has what's called built-ins that are defined. So built-ins are commonly used uh, functionalities. So commonly used that Python says, hey, it would be kind of silly for you to have to redefine the meaning of these and reinvent the, the meaning of all these different concepts each time you wanted to run a program. So I can actually pull up uh, a list of the built-in functions that would exist in this particular space in memory. Uh, and what we would see are, you know, one, one that we might use very soon is the input function. This allows you to ask the user to, hey, give you some piece of data so that uh, your program can respond to that. So maybe you ask the user, what's your current quiz grade? And it uses that input uh, to control the, the rest of the operation of the program. So these built-ins are all going to be defined in a certain space of our call stack, right? So I should say this is our call stack. And so we might have a function like input. And input would ultimately be bound to a function that's defined in Python. And we're not going to worry ourselves with the details of this uh, too much. But there's a number of these, right? We just saw a list of them. Uh, I'm not sure how many there are. And this number changes over time as new versions of Python are released. There might be new built-ins added to the language. But when, you, when your program begins, there will be some names that are available to you that you didn't have to define. They just exist, like the ability to ask the user for input. You know, another one uh, that's great is this abs function, which has nothing to do with abdominal muscles. It has to do with the absolute value. So that's how you can determine the absolute value of a number. All of those functions, the names of them, have a meaning before your code begins. When your code actually starts running, and we'll look at this in the very next uh, set of lessons is uh, you're going to your definitions are going to exist in what's called the globals area, right? Technically, um, you could consider these built-ins to all also be defined in globals, but for our purposes, we're going to make this distinction because in the future you're not going to diagram built-ins. We're just going to assume they exist, and our focus is only going to be when we start to diagram these concepts. What are the things that we defined in our programs ourselves? So soon we'll see how we can define variables and assign or bind meanings to them. So let's imagine we had defined a variable such as quiz score, 
and assigned a you know a value of 100, right? So we're we're perfect. Um, we'll see that the way that we keep track of what names have meanings in our programs, we don't yet know how we would define a variable such as this in our program, but we'll keep track of those variables at first in the globals frame as we're seeing here. Uh, and so we would call this area a frame and we'll learn later that there are ways that we can add additional frames. And this gives us the ability to have isolation and, and protection between our frames and to keep our names aligned. Well, lots of lots of things that we don't need to worry ourselves with right now. What I'm hoping to impart with you on this particular board and the key takeaway here is that when your program begins, it's going to be interpreted by the Python interpreter, which is a program that can read in your code, check its syntax, and if it looks like it's right, it will then try and evaluate it. When it evaluates it, as you define things, as we'll soon learn, the things that you define are going to be in globals. So I might actually make a, a note of that. Uh, your definitions will be here. There are other parts of memory that we'll learn about as we get into the course. Um, but for now, hopefully you have a, a little bit of a sense that, okay, we start out with some things that are de facto provided by the programming language itself. And then we'll be able to start making our own definitions and we can start saying what certain things mean in our programs. If we're making a game, maybe we would keep track of you know, player one score and player two score. Uh, if we're making Instagram, we would need a variable to keep track of you know, all of the colors that make up our picture uh, and put some names to these concepts. And so that's one, gonna be one of our concerns. How do we name the concepts that, that go into our program? Um, and we need to learn what are the instructions and how do we actually write valid programming language statements to have this kind of an impact on our environment, right? So this was a very quick look at the uh, differences between what is a program, it's a sequence of instructions, and ultimately we're gonna be building up memory as our program is evaluated. We write those programs in a language and we'll be focused on the Python programming language. The, the code that we write is going to be read, checked for syntax, and evaluated by an interpreter, by the Python interpreter. And as each you know, declaration or definition and statement, which we'll learn all about, is evaluated, it's gonna have different impacts on our program's memory. So we're gonna learn about memory diagrams and practice keeping track of all of the different things going on in our programs. Ultimately, as you become more confident as a programmer, you won't need to diagram in this detailed of a way, but it helps to really speed up your understanding of what's going on behind the scenes if you have a way of understanding exactly what the semantics of your code and the instructions that you write are.